in church how is everybody today yay i'm good i'm good i uh i'm happy to see everybody um uh this morning um i know anyone who attended encounter night last night must be tired i'm tired um it was a great night though um, i'm grateful uh, that we were all here um so a uh, special welcome to any guests any people uh uh who are here for the first time, um, or if you haven't filled out a welcome card, uh, they're in a seat uh, right in front of you. Uh, you can fill one of those out so we can connect with you. Um, also, you could download our app um, and stay in touch with, with any updates uh, on events uh, coming up um, at Vision Church. So, okay, so who we are. We are an evangelistic discipling ministry. We build people who build the church. Um, so, in simple words, that's just uh, us as a ministry, Vision Church. Uh, we exist to um, build each other up uh, to, uh, to, to bring more people to Jesus. Uh, all right, so announcements. I'm going to move on to announcements. Uh, next Sunday, uh, there's a combined service. Uh, it's at 9.30 a.m., so instead of 9.30 and 11, um, we're having one service, and it's at 9.30. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to add in, if you are yeah. connected, anyone you're connected with during the week that's a Vision Church member, just mention it in your conversation with them or throw them a text just because it's, we want to make sure everyone gets to the service next week and doesn't show up at 11. Yeah. Uh, definitely important. Um, so what else can we talk about? Oh. Uh, this coming Wednesday is a prayer meeting. Um, so every other Wednesday we have either a prayer meeting or a game night. This past Wednesday was a game night. It's, uh, that's an opportunity to fellowship. Uh, we have board games and food and popcorn. Uh, it's a really fun night. And then on the off Wednesdays we meet for prayer. We pray for the church. We pray for our communities. We pray for each other. Um, this Wednesday is a prayer meeting. I encourage you guys to come. It's been really good. Last week was amazing. Um, it's always amazing. Um, but come and be encouraged and come and uh, be blessed. Um, I'm going to pass the mic off to, oh, sharing his presence. Thank you, Megan. Yes, sharing his presence, December 9th. It's going to be really good. Carrie, did you want to share anything more sure, about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So there's still time to sign up in the back. There's a sheet. If you want to share something uh, with us, one of your talents, one of your gifts, please, we would love for you to. And nothing is too small. So just um, chat with me if you have a question about it. But it is... December 9th at 7 p.m., and we are going to have a dress rehearsal for that the Thursday before, which is December 7th, and there will be a dress, it'll be a dress rehearsal slash uh, setup for it, and so for that night, if you have any artwork or um, craftsmanship, something you created that is going to be on display for Saturday, you need to bring that item with you for on Thursday evening. So we're going to have like our host and hospitality team set up and decorate. Everyone can pitch in, but we're going to also have a dress rehearsal for the, the lineup for that night. So I think that's it. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's going to be fun, uh, sharing his presence. Uh, uh, we want to, we have our TNT time now, um, and I want to pass off the mic to Lincoln. Um, he's got a testimony to share for us. Lincoln. So um, last night I was, uh, I came to the encounter night. The encounter night was amazing. You guys should all come if you aren't. Um, but um, I've just been struggling with having like a chaotic mind and just tormenting thoughts, and the Lord just freed me of that last night. That's my testimony. Can I get a volunteer to pray? Amanda? Amanda said she had done. Oh, okay, one moment, please. All right, my turn. So listen, we have an interactive church. What kind of church is this? It's a what? Interactive church. Oh my goodness. 
somebody to mute the Isinkin channel? We have an interactive church, and so in our interactive church, we have a front row that is reserved for people who want prayer at any time. We have a cross that you can pin up a prayer, request something you want to lay down to the Lord, and then you're going to take that when God answers that prayer, and you're going to post it in the back in the cafe. Uh, I'd like love to see more of that because it gives the impression that the, Jesus isn't answering prayers, and I know he is. And so then we want you to take a step of faith and practice being an actual witness for Jesus. We understand what I'm saying. It's not just being the nice person in the crowd of angry people. Okay? That's not really a testimony for Jesus because you're not bringing his name into the conversation, into the public realm. It's a testimony when you give God glory and you're ascribing your success or your win, your experience with your relationship to Jesus. Because there's lots of nice people out there that don't know Jesus, right? There are. There's lots of charitable, decent people out there, and they don't know Jesus. And so if you want to honor the Lord and you, you know, give him kind of like, thank you, God, like thanks are great, but then put some action to that in some faith of sharing how God is because somebody will hear that and that becomes a living testimony that somebody else can grab a hold of. And, you know, you might have people coming up to you then. I know that might sound a little scary, but, hey, could you tell me more? Like, what happened? Because they have the same need. Because we all are needy people. That's why we have Jesus. If we didn't need, if we weren't needy, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. If we could figure it out, if we fix our problems, what would be the point of Jesus coming into the world? And so since that's not the truth, since the reality is, is that the things that God has for us, these things that God wants to do and move in our lives, require us to prayerfully come to him intentionally, but then to also honor him with what he has done, uh, because he's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. And so let's Let's, uh, let's get ready. Let's have somebody open in prayer, and let's get ready to worship. Who was going to pray? Amanda. 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 Um, dear God, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Um, whether we came here um, easily or if it was difficult to get here, we are here to worship you. We're here to thank you. And us where we are and bring us to where we need to be. Thank you, Lord.
heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. That's for somebody. Apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. So if you feel like that's speaking to you, you got to act on it. Faith is synonymous, is, is synonymous with obedience, trust. that the Lord is speaking to you specifically about something, that's, that's your nudge. Go get it. Go do it. We thank you, Lord. We love it, Lord, when you talk to us. We love to hear your voice, Jesus. Even when you tell us no, God, it's good. Even when you say wait, it's good because we heard from Jesus. helps us to see that you care. You care enough to speak. You care enough to guide. We love your voice, Jesus. And we all hear from you this morning.
Thank you, Lord, that when we say your name, it matters. It's not just God. It's Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that when we speak your name, <clears throat> whether it's in our home, whether it's in our workplace, whether it's in our classroom, whether it's wherever we go, Lord, that people would sense your presence when we say your name. I have a thought. Um, I'm just going to share it. I feel like this would be a good moment um, to have communion. We don't have to, if Pastor Nate doesn't want to do it as a whole group, it could just be, if you're resonating with what I'm resonating with, you could grab one and do it on your own, but the message really is like an obedience and a surrender, like seeking the Lord for knowledge, for understanding, humbling your heart before him. If you really love him, that means you obey his word. That was, that's a scripture in, I think, John um, that Carrie was quoting. And I just really feel a heavy heart. Like I need to repent and I need to turn my eyes back to him. Just repent of the times that even in the smallest ways I didn't, listen to his still small voice or didn't didn't trust him fully in something i doubted so i'm going to i'm going to have a moment with the lord with that but i just want to encourage if there's other people you feel like you want to just repent and give a new measure of something to the lord and then have communion because that's what communion's all about recognizing where where we are at in need of him, right? Like we need his, the blood of his sacrifice. We needed him to die on the cross for us. We're not enough. So I will just play this next song and anyone who feels like they want to take communion can just walk up and take it right out of the basket next to the cross here. Okay? All right. So as we were singing, I got still and I felt like I sensed like peace like a river. And when I looked the verse up, it said, if only you had paid attention to my command. Your peace would have been like a river, your well being like the waves of the sea. And I just felt like after what she shared, that that just kind of like, I just had to share that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well being like the waves of the sea.
Kids, get ready. Get ready. <clears throat> if you guys want to pull up some scripture while I'm doing this, you can. Uh, unless you haven't been trained in that <clears throat> in the sound booth <clears throat> if you want to turn in your Bible to Psalm 73 Psalm 73 <clears throat> Psalm 73 it is natural for us to look around at the world and compare the actions of others, right? It's just inherently normal. You look at what someone else is doing, and you like it, you love it, or you hate it, right? This, some people are just indifferent, too. They're just like, whatever. You know, everything's apathetic. Um, but we look at what's going around and there's one area in particular that I feel is a place that often comes up in people's hearts when they question the existence of God or when they question their own lives and what they're doing and values and it's when we see the wicked prosper it is an area that is a stumbling block to anybody, believer, unbeliever. But why do we care? Why is their prosperity bothering us? Um, is it because we envy their wealth or their seemingly lack of suffering like it just seems like they just whatever they do works and they get away with everything and anything and they can do whatever they want right sometimes we see that with the justice system we see people who seem to be above the law they can somebody who's innocent gets thrown in jail for a petty crime and then somebody who commits a federal or a capital offense because they know somebody or they're a celebrity or associated with a politician they they seem to get away with a slap on the wrist some bad press um, and everybody acknowledges that a crime was committed but they they're not in jail or how about the people who ended up in jail and then because somebody made a false accusation and they spent time in prison and then forensic science advanced and was able to test evidence through DNA testing and it was found that that individual was innocent that they were judged purely circumstantially they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and they fit the description and so they stuck it to them why do the wicked prosper why do the righteous Suffer. How many of you felt like you were doing everything right and yet you still suffered? You still got hurt. You still got punished. And, you, and, and, and you're like, it's unjust. And, and you even get angry at God because you're like, I, I did what I was supposed to do. So aren't good things supposed to happen? I think we've all experienced that. Well, let's look at Psalm 73, verse 1. I'm going to go right through this chapter. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who have hearts, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone, for I envied the proud. When I saw them prosper, despite their wickedness, they seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies 
are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They are not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace. And clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. The question I want to ask is that an actual true perspective? I'm willing to bet that all of us at one point or another have been in that position. Well, we said, I try to live right, and this wicked person, which is rightly true, they, are, they do wicked deeds, and they're, they don't follow the Lord, and they are categorically, scripturally speaking, a wicked person. And yet, you see them getting away with what they're doing. And the reason it probably really bothers you is because it's personal to you, Right? you can relate. It's somebody you know. It's somebody that your friend knows. Somewhere there's a connection. But I want to I challenge that thing. Do they really prosper? Are they really better off? Doesn't God say you reap what you sow? Doesn't he say God is not mocked? Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Just think of Facebook. Is the amazing profile you read reality? Or are they just highlighting things? Which is fine, because that's what we do. We want to share our highlights. And we want to share our lows. But they don't really fill the full in-between story, right? You don't know how they got to where they are. You don't know why that bad thing happened, per se. You don't know that they're even really suffering. Who was the, uh, what was the name? Uh, I was going to look him up. Well, no, never mind. Do they really prosper? I want to say no. How many of you guys uh, remember Bernie Madoff? All right, how many of you financially were affected by Bernie Madoff? I was. No, none of you guys? Okay. Bernie Madoff. He was a broker who amassed $65 billion he founded a penny stock brokerage in 1960. So he started with penny stocks. You know, you actually, you can buy in for pennies. It eventually grew into Madoff Investment Securities. He served as the company's chairman until his arrest on December 11th, 2008. So for 48 years, he ran a successful business for the elite, and it was private. He didn't do public, um, his advertisements and their financial dealings were, were mostly through, uh, they were presented in a, hey, I want to tell you about this investment group. It's kind of hush-hush, it's secret, but you know, everybody's jumping in, it's really hot, it, they're booming, you, I can show you the numbers, but the numbers were all doctored up. It was a Ponzi scheme. 48 years, he seemed like he was the elite, amazing, super broker. People just couldn't understand how he was so good. That year, he was the sixth largest market maker in the S&P 500 stocks. While the stock brokerage while the stock brokerage part of the business had a public profile, Madoff tried to keep his asset management business profile exclusive. At the firm, he employed his brother Peter Madoff as a senior manager, director, and chief compliance officer, Peter's daughter as the firm's rules and compliance officer and attorney, and his, now, and his son Mark Madoff and Andrew Madoff. 
On June 29, 2009, Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison. The maximum sentence allowed. His son Peter was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And then he sadly hanged himself two years after that. Exactly two years after his father's arrest. His son Andrew died of lymphoma. And then Bernie died in 2021 of chronic kidney disease. So he went from being the guy that everybody wanted to know and party with and do dine and get involved in his investment group because the yields were off the charts, man. This guy was, if you wanted to make some money, you wanted to know this man. And so for 48 years, obviously he had humble beginnings in the start, but it went pretty quick. He seemed like he was it. But all the while, it was built on a lie. The whole thing. If a man robs a bank of a million dollars cash, which nobody gets away with that anymore. If you're doing any kind of that banking, you're doing it through the internet. Banks don't carry that kind of cash. Let's say you robbed a bank and got a million dollars cash, and you got away with it. What does got away with it look like? One year? Ten years? Fifteen years? Did you really win? Did you really get away with it? Did the wicked really prosper? Do crime, does crime really pay? if you end up paying more than you even gained later in punishment, in fees, in prison? How much is your freedom worth? Madoff, I mean, people wanted to kill the guy anywhere he went. He couldn't even walk in public without security. Because, I mean, 46 65 billion dollars when you're rolling with that kind of money you hurt millions of people so i say he didn't get away with it even if you go to the grave almost you're going to stand before the judge of the living and the dead and in Ecclesiastes, he says, God, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and he says that he will reward everyone according to their good and evil deeds. So you're going to get rewards or you're going to get punishment. And so really, whatever time frame a person prospers in this life, eventually you're going to be judged. The wicked, verse 8. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut through the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what is happening? Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. And so here's a spiritual principle and in law in, on the books that God has established. You reap what you sow. The only way you're going to get out of the debt of wickedness is through Christ. So don't, don't fall into the trap of the wicked ever prospering because they never prosper. The bill is going to come due. Some people pledge their lives to Satan so that they can become famous and rich. There's lots and lots of stories of that. The next day, or that week, or a month later, somebody knocked on their door, a phone call came in, a brokerage firm, I, just Satan prospered them because he had their soul. Does cash, gold, do any of those things really matter in eternity? In the big picture, they don't. Does God even know? 
No, my Bible says that pride goes before a fall. Woe to the person. I mean, when, when somebody starts bragging on, and all through the Word we see this. We see kings, and we see priests who did not restrain their tongue, who allowed the praises of men to elevate them to where they thought that they were God, and they fell over dead. They got struck down. They received a disease. God prophesied that how long they would live. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being told how long you would live by God, and you could actually count the days down to when you were going to die? What kind of torment is that? And you're no... You're not going in the right direction. In James 4, I'm trying to marry this into this message this morning. He says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Woe to you when the world speaks well of you. Like when you're living righteous, when you're counting the cost and you're saying, I'm not going to go with the crowd because the crowd is walking off a cliff. Because the straight and narrow is straight and narrow. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. But broad is the gate and <laughs> wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that are going in that way. I love the, the opening captions of The Chosen TV show. How many of you guys watch that? Have seen The Chosen? And you see the fish going in a circle, and then all of a sudden one of the fish changes color and starts swimming the opposite direction. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's, it's, it, it's a really small detail. Because they're the ones that are being snatched out of the world in Jesus' name, and they're swimming counterculture. They're not going with the crowd anymore. And sometimes that feels lonely until the fish get together, and then you got your own school. But if you're looking around and you're saying, the whole world, they're all getting rich. Look at, look at Wall Street. Look at, look at this person. Look at that person. Look at how this person got away with their crime. Did they really get away? The judge has got excellent records. He's got everything in 8K. Do we have TVs yet to do that? Don't, or I think we've moved past 4K, haven't we yet? Isn't there a TV that's higher than that now? Well, listen, he would got it. he would got it. He's got it in high def. He's got full recordings of everything. It's like you're in your own reality TV show, and every place you ever were and anything you ever did was recorded. And he is going to... Render judgment eventually, and he's going to reward and pay everyone what there's their due. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting eternal life. Yes, eternal life. There is a reward. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. Doubt. We get in the place of doubt. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Right? When you, when you plant your foot and you say, I am not going to do that. Because God says, no. He says it's evil. He says it's wrong. He's, there's a consequence there. I'm going to toe the line. I'm not going to spread the lie. I'm not going to continue the gossip. I'm not going to invest in that thing. I'm going to take a stand. Verse 14, I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to... If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Verse 17, then I went into your sanctuary. Come on. 
at some church, got into the presence of the people of God who are seeking the face of Jesus and entering into his presence, into the king's courts, into a, a, a place where we have the proper perspective. Oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. So he stopped looking at what was presently happening and was considering down the road what is to come and realized they're not prospering. They are set up for a great fall. Truly, you put them on slippery paths and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed completely as well away by terrors when you arise O Lord you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning doesn't his presence reset your perspective doesn't God's divine world perspective this is why he says that my ways are not your ways Neither are my thoughts your thoughts, for my ways are higher than your ways as the heavens are above the earth. Like, I think of it as like the bird's eye view of looking at humanity through time and where you're really going. Because this life, this time, it's... People who are older in years will tell you, I can't believe how, how fast it went by. And then it's over. But it's over, and then the real true life, eternity starts. This is but a blink. Verse 21. Then I realized that my heart was bitter. And I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. You lead me to a glorious destiny. Right? We're not focusing just on today. There is a future hope. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My heart may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And if he is yours, then you are his and you will be with him in eternity. And one day I will see you on the other side of this place and we're not going to regret the decisions and the sufferings and the persecution and the heartache because we're going to be walking in eternity. We're going to be in the place where he wipes away every tear, where death, sorrow, sickness, none of those things remain, where the wicked are put underneath his feet. They are thrown into captivity. They are in the lake of fire. Hell and destruction is no longer affecting us because Christ is with us, ruling and reigning, and we are with him forever. And that, man, that is our hope. That is the blessed hope. That is the blessed hope. The scripture says that he who meditates on these things purifies and keeps himself. It's the healthy place to be. That's the right headspace. That's why you can laugh Sometimes at the hardship, because you can be like, this is not permanent. Hallelujah. I can move it on. It's not permanent. This is a temporary problem. God has a long-term solution. My health may fail. My spirit may grow weak. But God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish. For you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord. Listen, nobody's tricking him. Don't, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will surely reap. Like, like people need to get the message. Like, don't say I'm going to live wicked until I'm older. 
Or when, you know, when I get, when I finish sowing my oats, when I finish enjoying and filling up my flesh with everything I can do, then I'll turn to God because I know he'll forgive me. You don't know what's going to happen. You, there's an adversary looking to take you out. Allow a little of the fear of God in your life to say, you know what? It's not worth the risk. The sovereign Lord, my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. We've already got people that have tried this. In Ecclesiastes, we see with, this, with Solomon, he says, Verse 3, 2, Ecclesiastes 2, 3, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven. Whatever, verse 10, whatever my eye desired, I didn't keep from them. He was a rich man. He was a king. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked at on all the works of my hands had done, on the labor which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Think of it. You have the kind of wealth and you, whatever you think, whatever you're like, you know, I want that. I'll take two. You know, give me three and I'll give one away to somebody else. Like, there's no restriction. No, you just cast off all restraint. You do whatever your carnal desire wants. And Psalms are like, you know what? I found out it was all like grasping for the wind. When I thought I had something that was going to nurture and comfort my soul, it just... It, it didn't happen. It didn't, it, I didn't get what I thought. How many of you guys remember the song, I, Material Girl? You remember that song? Madonna? That was Madonna, wasn't it? She had this song about being materialistic. And I remember watching an interview with her where she said, you know, I came to realize after I wrote that song that materialism does not satisfy the soul. And I was like, whoa. Material girl <laughs> found out that materialism does not satisfy. America, if you live in America, you have the most, you are the wealthiest general population in history, in time. You, you live like kings. You have refrigerators. You have markets. You can just go out and buy. You can have people deliver your food now right to your door. That used to be only for the rich elite. If you wanted to eat, you used to have to go out in the field and pluck it out of the ground and plow it and make it work and make it happen. You have amazing technology. You have amazing services. You have, I mean, just the utility grid alone. You're not out there chopping firewood and stoking the fire. Well, some of us are because we like doing that. But you don't have to. Like, there are options. We have at the height so much stuff, and yet depression is up, suicide is up. The height of technology, the height of access to information. You literally can skip school now. Everything, you can go to college for free. You can sit and audit classes. You, you have the internet. You can access any subject in different languages. You don't even have to learn the languages. And yet, people... We're just getting lower and lower. I realized my heart was bitter. He realized his heart was bitter because it was in the wrong place. So guard against bitterness. Get it back into his presence. I would dare say that you've been focusing so much on the presence of bitterness. You've been a friend of bitterness so long that you've lost the presence of Jesus. You've lost the presence of his joy. 
You, you, you want to guard against the injustice, the wronging, where you see the wicked prosper? Remember what their end looks like and what your end looks like. And then you'll have pity and mercy in your heart towards them and understanding that I wouldn't wish hell on anybody. You want to guard against the comparison where it seems like the wicked guy, the wicked gal, the other person, they lied on their application, they cheated in the process, they paid someone off for a favor, and they seemingly got ahead of you. Listen, eventually it's going to come to light. Eventually their bill is going to come due. You want to guard against inequality? Understand that God sends the rain upon the wicked and the righteous. He's just merciful. He's just good. He's looking for them to repent. He's giving them time. Even in the book of Revelation, he says concerning Jezebel, who was sowing and teaching people to live in wickedness, he says, I gave her time that she would repent, but she did not. And so we see God's heart. That when he sees the wicked, he sees a wayward child that he wants to come back to him, to turn to him, to choose him. And he's giving them time. Remember that. They're running out of time. That's a good way of looking at it. The bill is going to come due. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Did the Madoff family get ahead? You think they knew they were going to be dying at young ages? I don't think they knew. I don't think they knew. None of us do. We don't know when our time is going to be up. He brought his family into a lie, and then some of them bought into the lie. And their end wasn't good. Public Worldwide shame, grief, I'm sure the health was declining, disease, suicide. God is not mocked. And so that's why it's good for us to gather. It's why it's good to turn our eyes back to Jesus and once again, lift his name up like we did this morning in worship to declare that he is good, that he is God, to declare our love for him and not the cares of this world. There's nothing wrong with being rich, but he says, don't set your heart on them because they're fleeting. They just... And in fact, the scripture says that he who gains riches through dishonesty... It's like fleeting sand. Jesus, I ask that you would write this upon our hearts, that we would truly be guarded from the deception, the stumbling block of the wicked prospering. That we would remember how we were once the wicked. We once did not acknowledge you. We once did not serve you. We once served ourselves. We once served the God of this world. We once pursued earthly, sensual, even demonic things. Whether it was it through ignorance or not, we did it. But you pulled us out. You chose us. You called us. You looked on us with compassion. You gave us a chance through your love. And so give us the Father's heart that we would see that the wicked do not prosper. That life is short. And the day is coming when we will be with you here. <laughs> It's not going to just be some angels up in the clouds. Like, we're going to be together. You're going to have a, your throne. You are ruling on the earth, and it's going to be glorious. And so thank you for choosing us. Thank you for bringing us into reality, taking us from our insanity, our ignorance, and showing us your ways. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen, amen.